Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining. We will wait a bit before we will start for other people to, to access the meeting or the session. Yeah, there's a couple more people coming on. Good. How nice. Welcome, everybody. Hey, Michael Polarski. Super. Terrific job. Welcome, um, I, welcome. I love that um, that uh, thing you did with um, the interview you did with Walter. Fantastic. And your, your, um, your Zoom video from that course is, will go up shortly. So, and you did a good job too, John, of course. Congratulations. Huh. Oh, well. Cheers, turmeric uh, tea. Uh, this is oat straw. <laughs> All right. I'll have the plate of mashed yeast. I, re I remember that from Woody Allen. Hilarious. Although Woody Allen is no longer acceptable, apparently. <laughs> attacked now when you bring him up. All right. Still pe people are joining the session, so we will wait for a couple of seconds, I guess, before we start, because we do have a packed program for today. Packed. Absolutely so packed. Yes. So perhaps Woody Allen is a bit like a lot of the world leaders today. Their bubble has been popped. People have seen <laughs> behind the screen. All right, I would like to start the session. Probably some more people will join, but um, let's start. Is everyone able to see my uh, screen? I can. Okay, that's perfect. Well, have, hello everyone and welcome again uh, to this last fireside chat session of 2021. I can't believe how fast the time is going. And this session, my name is, by the way, uh, Inge. I am a camp coordinator slash fundraiser for the ecosystem restoration camps. And this session today will be again with John D. Liu, the founder of the ecosystem restoration camps, and Al Pier, the camp manager of functional forests. Uh, before we start, I would like to highlight some house rules. Um, I would like to ask you to please hold your question until after Alp's presentation, uh, because we would like to make this session interactive. So if you do have a question, you can go to the uh, reactions button, which is below in Zoom, and you can click on um, raising your hand, and we see that you have a question, and you can ask the question in person to Alp. And just for you to know, this session will last for about one hour. Um, and the room will be open for an open discussion afterwards. So you are able to leave, but you are also more than welcome to join and stay on. So first I will quickly share some camp news and camp opportunities with you before we uh, continue with uh, John. So the camp opportunities, uh, I first want to highlight that if you are interested in any of these opportunities, I recommend you to go to our website, that is ecosystemrestorationcamps.org, and you can go to our um, events and courses page, and uh, you can find all the extra information there. But first, uh, Camp Altiplano, they usually offer courses and experiences, but now are open for um, any volunteering help, and you can help with day-to-day -day tasks. Uh, and this opportunity is available until the 28th of February. And then we have the opportunity at Camp Embercombe in uh, Devon, the UK, and they uh, offer a winter rewilding experience. And you will learn more about rewilding the land, but also rewilding yourself. And this opportunity is from the 27th until the 30th of January. 
Then Camp Human Nature in Uganda also offer a volunteer, volunteering experiences. So there is not a set program, but you can help with day-to-day uh, -day tasks on this site. And uh, it's available from the 18th until the 27th. And you can apply and contact Camp Manager Ronald, who would be uh, happy to have a conversation with you. And then Camp Habiba in Egypt is uh, available for ongoing okay. camp experiences. Very excited and I hope that if you are able to travel or if you're close by that you uh, would uh, think about these opportunities. And then some camp news. Uh, currently we are onboarding quite some new camps, but already Camp Tanganyika in uh, Tanzania joined us. And this is a 15 acre um, conservation site that is helping local farmers with more sustainable uh, farming methods and conservation techniques. So we are very pleased that they joined us. And then Camp Humble Habitat in Sweden, which is a 15 hectare um, site that is depleted by uh, mining and uh, clear cutting and they are restoring this land. The camp manager David is a permaculture specialist, so he will uh, be hosting courses and experience from the spring onwards. And then we have some planting news. Camp Mombasa mangroves in Kenya was able to plant another 30,800 mangrove seedlings with the support from Impact Adventures. And uh, we are so pleased to hear that this forest is growing and growing by the help of Mubarak and his team. And then Camp Altiplano has successfully crowdfunded trees and shrubs that is needed for their agroforestry system. And they used our Plant for the Planet platform. Uh, we partnered up with this platform and we are happy to hear that we have a first small success with them. So hope to uh, have more in the future. And another good news is that Camp Cream Pub in South Africa has been made a supporting and implementing partner of the UN Decade of Ecosystem Restoration. So um, that's it, all great news. Well, John, I would like to give the word to you and I know that you enjoy talking in person. So there you go. Okay, well, um, it's lovely to see everybody. And um, although it's still a trying time, um, <clears throat> Lots is happening. So um, I actually, I, as much as I like to speak live and I will continue to speak live, I am going to share something with you now. And, and I, I, I've been covert by making sure that it's going to be used. <laughs>
Well, thanks for listening and welcome. I just wanted to say a few things about what I've been thinking about <clears throat> mainly. So what I've, what I've been thinking about a lot is uh, central kitchens. I've noticed how many people are in need of food. And I think that one of the things that we can do in ecosystem restoration camps, for instance, but not only, is to build central kitchens. And central kitchens can feed the campers, feed the growing community surrounding this, but it can also react to special situations like disasters or uh, bumper crops even. So if you have central kitchens, it's possible to use them to um, process all surplus foods. So nothing needs to go to waste. And it's also possible, I've, I've been noticing a lot of people have been sick around here in the Netherlands, and I've been making soup and sending out the soup. And it seems to make them feel better. I think they need to eat. Sometimes, probably not too much, but some. And I think it's really good. You know, if you, if you infuse the soup with the intention that everybody who eats it gets well, then that's really a good soup. And soup is fun to make, you know, because you can make it out of a whole lot of different things. And it's possible just to keep soup all the time in case, you know, and, and when you see people, you say, have you eaten? If they say no, you say, you should try this soup. And, you know, everybody who eats the soup gets healed. Anyway, central kitchens also allow for some other changes in consumption patterns. For instance, we can ensure that there's no packaging on the food just by buying in bulk from the producers. And by buying directly from the producers, we can say, well, we only want organic or biodynamic. We don't want to go searching for that stuff. We want that to arrive and we'll subsidize you. We'll, we'll, we'll consistently pay you like with community supported agriculture. And that that's the relationship with all the food producers. And that core of people, if it gets into 150 or 200, of course, it's, it's actually very useful for those producers to get an income. But it also means that these people who are in the community can also work in community-based agriculture and in rewilding and restoration of degraded landscapes. And they all need to be fed. And then the other thing that I've been thinking about besides central kitchens and how, how great an idea that is, is creator spaces. So perfect shops for woodworking, metalworking, and mechanics. And industrial sewing, ceramics, craft, stonework, building, design, art, and have just a perfect shop at every camp with all the tools which are necessary to do everything and that they belong in trust to the community. I would recommend that retired master craftsmen curate these collections of tools and machines and that they are supported by a number of younger engineers and, and mechanics and craftsmen and that together they have a collective, well, understanding of all the 
equipment and machines and measuring devices and cutting devices and finishing devices, whatever is needed. And that everything is there and it's available to everyone in the community. In fact, it belongs to the community because it's part of a community trust. And that community is also engaged in the central kitchen and probably could be engaged in ecosystem restoration camps, activities. It could be an emerging eco-village. But regardless, it seems like the task now is to restore all degraded lands on the earth. It seems like only through this method can we address all of the problems that we have because we have these quite serious climate-related problems, but they stem from centuries and millennia long inequitous cultures that have sought to dominate and have literally committed mass genocide and slavery. And humanity has repeatedly stood up and said, okay, we don't like that. that, that's not okay. And all of the great literature is saying war is hell. And the collective heartbreak that's there in the world is tragic. And I think what's exciting and interesting about taking on quietitude and taking on profound meditation of physicality to some extent, but also metaphysical things, philosophical things, and studying using scientific method, I would say. So we should look very careful at data and we should understand what that we can glean information from this data. And this information can become knowledge. And this knowledge ideally becomes wisdom. And that in fact, as a species, there is a collective intelligence, a collective consciousness. So we're each of us contributing our individual consciousness to the collective consciousness. And what we find is that the more we are living our lives in service, we get more and more satisfaction and joy from living. And our lives are given meaning this way. And it, it stops being pointless about being on a, a hamster wheel that's driven by an evil cabal that's running an economic system and political domination of people all over the world with military weapons and the threat of violence. And we, when it seems like when you meditate into this space, there's an element of childlike innocence there with which you can look at the world with awe and wonder. And I think this is of critical importance because if we are judging things based on our knowledge, it's most definitely a limited understanding because when we start to study, we pretty quickly come up against some quite interesting concepts like infinity or time and space 
and physicality and energy and flow states and waves. And all of these things are, are of great interest and, and they could be pursued ad infinitum. And so you would never, never finish because they're infinite. But if they're, so if you can see these various concepts in relationship with other c concepts, then you begin to see a multidimensional and symbiotic state in which all living things are interconnected. And the breath of the vegetation and the breath of the animals are traded. And the microbes and the fungi and the insects and the birds and the, and the, and the animals, as well as the grasses and the trees and the flowers and the berries and the fruits and the giant trees and the coral reefs and sea grasses and mangroves and savannas and wetlands and peat, peat marshes and alpine systems and the beautiful rivers around the world. So what I've noticed in studying this is one, it gives me a, um, some satisfaction to look at the way nature is uh, evolving and what it evolves into and its incredible beauty and, and resilience. And, and then, you know, in comparison to human endeavors, human endeavors seem much smaller, much less important. So that means we are less important. And that's a kind of interesting thing. So I don't know if I've told you this before, but I have this thing with my wife where she tells me that my Igor is too big and she means my ego. But actually I feel often very insecure and um, that's, I call that Eeyore from the donkey in Winnie the Pooh. And I think that those, the Igor and Eeyore thing is about polar opposites or polar differences. And so if you're on one pole and on the Igor scale or you're on the other end of the scale on the Eeyore scale, you're either way too confident and, and you know, We've observed that kind of behavior recently. It's domination and, and prejudice and fascistic and grotesque and, and uh, silly and dangerous all at the same time. So on the Eeyore side, if you just really feel like nobody's listening and there's nothing that can be done. Well, that's terrible. And I don't believe that. So in the middle, though, is a balance where you're not overconfident or arrogant, but you're also not too afraid to do what needs to be done. So I think that's a kind of thing that I'm thinking about for ecosystem restoration camps, besides the fact that they're doing regenerative agriculture, they're rewilding, they're restoring degraded landscapes, and they're doing it in communities with beautiful central kitchens and great food, and they're doing it with wonderful tools and, and shops that are all supported by the community. And so welcome to this. I'm, I've talked a little longer than I usually do, but thanks a lot for coming. And now I think we're going to hear from Alp, who's in Turkey, and, and it's challenging to, to be there, and he's doing really, really good work. And he could use some help, and I'm sure all of us can. So welcome again.
Thank you, John, for sharing these words. I think we can all relate to what you were saying on, on another level. So thank you. And I really love the sentence, knowledge becomes wisdom. So um, we probably have some time to uh, reflect or discuss uh, your um, yeah, conversation after Alp's presentation and after the Q&A. So yes, I would like to go to... Um, the host of tonight, um, and I quickly will share my screen again with you. Uh, before I do that, I will take the box to optimize the video because I would like to introduce you to Alp. I have a little um, video for you um, to share his land. Land with. Is everyone able to see it? Good morning, it? everyone. This is our functional forest. Yes, we got We can see it. On the implementation site. And we began working here approximately a couple of years ago. Uh, it's a barren land with lots of rocks and no organic material in the soil whatsoever. And we've been planting rigorously over 6,000 trees in the meantime. And we're planning on planting another 20 to 30,000. Um, in and amongst the rows, we're planting grains, seasonal grains. And we have a lot of varieties on the property. I just want to give you a general feeling of how we're situated here so you can get a sense. And you can see that our grains are now gently showing their, in themselves and it, it just provides a beautiful, beautiful sight. We do look very much forward to welcoming you here anytime that will be possible for you. Uh, much love and greetings from Turkey. Bye. Thank you, Alp. Alp, are, are you ready to take over and, and bring us along your journey of restoring your, uh, your land? Thank you, Inge. Yes, thank you. Um, and thanks to John and to the Ecosystem Restoration Camp's movement to give me this opportunity to share uh, what we are up to and how we see the world from where we are. Um, hopefully, I'll give... Um, an impression that will be useful for everyone who's participating here tonight. Um, I've been asked to have some visuals and a presentation, and I think um, just as a context, uh, no need to uh, deepen the bad news on one side, on the one hand, but on the other, I think to create a context, um, and please bear with me with the beginning of the presentation where I kind of uh, give a little background uh, and then hopefully move quickly enough to give you enough visuals to see what uh, we've been able to do. Um, and I'll be very excited to hear about your questions and hopefully be able to respond to them. So let me try to share the screen here. Is that working for everyone? Yes, we yes. can see it up. Yeah, let me try to make this small so this is just out of the way. It's a terrible sight, though. Yeah, this is, I chose to put this on there um, because this is what our uh, most precious part um, of the hills and the mountainsides uh, turned into this past summer. Um, over the course of three weeks, we have um, had devastating wildfires. Um, and more so devastating was the social impact that we have encountered where when we were trying to um, um, work with our villagers and, and try to um, extinguish fires, we were uh, not being helped by the local government and and things have moved very slowly and i hate to talk about this and as i said i kind of pre-warned you and and um the latest is that uh, we're hearing increasingly that in the areas that have been burned um uh, licenses uh, are being uh, given out for mining companies and um have villagers burned down olive groves and and um you know um, properties, agricultural properties, are being confiscated by the government for um, uh, either uh, 
uh, wind uh, energy projects or solar energy projects. So that's why I just wanted to um, put a context. I mean, I will give you a little more context than this, but this is why I, I put this picture in the beginning. Um, I think the most meaningful way to succeed is the feet. And here, I don't only mean others in form of human beings, but also in form of all living and non-living beings. Um, we have a mission that we define as um, nourishing life. That's what we want to live for. That we, that's what we live for. Um, and we vision a world where humanity associates the main source of its basic needs, both physical, such as food, fodder, medicine, fuel, building materials, fibers, dyes, and glues, uh, mental and spiritual, uh, in form of meaning and joy relationship, participation, personal growth and contribution. Uh, with functional forests, we envision a world where humanity associates these basic needs with functional forests, which is not a concept. It is a method. It is a method in development uh, that is based on over 20 years of experimental work that aims to respond to ecological, economic and social vulnerabilities in the Mediterranean region. Um, why functional forests? I think our focus needs to be um, pronounced as um, agricultural productivity um, that um, is an essential part of human civilization uh, and cultures, which includes cultural values and land tenure and traditional cropping patterns and weather and climate. It, it, it uh, uh, relies on a, a variety of factors. Um, it relies on having the right quality and amounts of plants and animals and tools and fertilizers. I won't go into the end of each sentence. Um, we need to have adequate and accessible markets and transportation and storage and processing facilities and price incentives for things to work. And I think John's central kitchen's idea is a phenomenal one. If we can um, uh, work out the WeQ in terms of working out um, the, the, the linkages the end-to-end -end linkages to what we produce on the countryside into the cities and um, peripheries of cities. Um, not to mention places uh, like um, Kogis and, and Mula, where, where, where we live, uh, where we have been hardly hit by these wildfires and it has affected um, human lives tremendously, also on the countryside. Um, um, so agricultural improvement, if we may call it in, in other terms, is vitally affected by, by human motivation and self-confidence and hard work and decision-making ability and willingness of people to work together, which is, as we um, observe, on the one hand is becoming more and more difficult given the socioeconomic status that one has uh, or more easy as we are in some form and shape are experiencing here. Um, world hunger, no need, need to say, is getting worse. Food prices are soaring, poor are getting poorer, hungry getting hungrier. Land, water, energy, and fertilizer prices are um, increasing more than ever and is in tight supply, even if you have access. Um, um, you may have to wait for a, a period of time that uh, just um, causes you to miss uh, your right timing of planting or pre or post planting fertilization. Um, modern productivity techniques along with growing demand for food are undermining ecology, which is uh, uh, well represented in, in the effects of climate change. Um, and increases in food production um, will require the solution of more ecological, technical, sociological, economic, and political problems. So there is a, an array of aspects that, that need consideration, that need an attitude, a mindset uh, that we ought to develop to be able to respond to all these complex challenges at hand. And I, again, won't go through the, the, this list, but there's, there's a list that I, I tried to lay out where you see on the left side, the conventional uh, farming and forestry mindset 
um, versus the functional forests mindset, um, where we um, put at the heart of all uh, systemic thinking um, and um, human-based uh, needs and necessities. Um, how do functional forests help diminish or eliminate factors that affect agricultural productivity? Um, we do multi-layered, multifunctional, and locally adapted plant uh, variety plantings that assure economic, ecological, and social resilience. When I say economic, um, I mean uh, being able to harvest already over a course of two, three months period uh, by means of using both annual and biennial and perennial plants. Um, Plant-based wind, sun, and sound breaks uh, functions in form of providing the uh, uh, necessity for the particular area that we're working on to, to produce microclimates and to um, have a better uh, possibility for plants to adapt should they be um, adapted from, from uh, non-local uh, circumstances. Um, we integrate biodiverse biomass production to ensure resilience against drought by increasing soil organic matter on an annual basis, hence eliminating external input of fertilizers over time. Um, and diminish price and marketing vulnerabilities by establishing long-term individual and community partnerships, increase biodiversity by means of using up to 80% local perennial varieties propagated locally. Um, I will be able to uh, show some of our work with regard to this. Um, and we're in the process of training local farmers to trades for qualified laborers and and uh, my friend uh, um, and partner Gyokan and Ahu uh, today shared their experience with me, whereby uh, an elder in the village has said that I think it is time for us to start using OMS method, which is a reason for me to start crying because I've been working for this for 10 years and it did not, it did not really go anywhere for, for um, um, lack of a better word, um, I would have liked to have made um, progress a lot faster, but now that the the prices um, have soared to such a degree, um, people are inevitably starting to think that, you know, uh, we need to start taking care of our own needs uh, in our own, um, on our own land. Um, so inspiring and catalyzing the power of, a, of communities is um, the biggest challenge that we've been uh, confronting and, and that we are seeing uh, will show better results as um, circumstances get tougher and tougher. Um, yeah, so I think um, for the sake of using the time uh, as best as I can, this is something that I thought was really interesting to share. Uh, diversity as we see it in, in these circles is usually with regard to plants and animals and um, flora and fauna. I think this is really nice to, to look at um, and try to communicate with those, with the non-converted maybe I should call, um, um, that diversity is as important for natural systems as it is for human cultures. Imagine not having this uh, language um, distribution around the world, which is obviously extremely simplified. Uh, there are thousands uh, of languages that are also um, and becoming extinct uh, day, day to day. Um, and from there, I uh, want to jump onto a campsite. This is the function for this uh, campsite. And um, that looked like the surface of Mars. This is what it looked like in 2018 when we uh, started work here. This is not the only other and only area where we work on. We have four implementation sites. We have um, um, where we live and where I'm speaking to you today, uh, where we basically have um, all of our um, evolutionary steps in the last 10 uh, years uh, concentrated. And from here on, uh, we um, 
work both on this property and on three other properties. And one of those properties is our campsite in Zeytin Alana, which used to look like this and from a height a little bit like this with uh, conventional um, olive groves uh, surrounding it uh, or open uh, seasonal grain um, pastures that are also seasonal. Um, so this is, this is the size, it's approximately four hairs. Uh, and we dare to start planting in this manner using plenty of varieties and, and trees, local uh, fruit uh, and, and nitrogen fixing varieties from seed and also from seedlings over time. Uh, this is what it looks like recently. Um, and the plantings on contour. Uh, here is a picture that has been taken um, recently, 12th of December. You see along the contour lines, the organic matter that has been uh, organized and the plants that have been organized along um, the 12 meter um, height difference of the property from top to, to bottom. Um, Here's our land um, uh, home. And, and look from bottom up, you see both local wild varieties that have planted from uh, as well as um, annual to uh, perennial nitrogen fixers, ground covers, um, plants that are. Uh, are you able to hear me? I'm just getting a message that my connection is unstable. Yes, we can hear you. Okay. And could you, uh, Inge, please also give me a heads up in terms of timing? Yes. Um, preferably, it would be great if you could maybe close like two to three, four minutes. Two to three, four minutes. Okay, let me fly then. Um, or, or five. So this or is five. what it, Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, so then I'll move the um, close, closer ups alongside the control lines here. Uh, this is more midsummer, where grains have been grown and only harvested um, from top and stalks are um, down because uh, the Soil temperatures reach 60, 65 degrees in the summertime. Uh, so these are the uh, border plantings that are also very recent. Uh, these pictures are recent. Here is our home and our base. Um, here is where we have our uh, greenhouse, our seed garden. I had a little uh, one minute video of Hmm? Uh, uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Uh, if you if you yes. shut down your video, uh, when you stop your video, then sharing your screen, uh, your performance will be increased probably. Can you can you please try? Shut down Just my stop, video. Yeah, stop your video and then con continue to sharing your screen. Probably it will be more. Uh, easier to transfer for the line. Oh, like that. Okay, like this. Okay. Yep. Okay. Is this still visible? Yeah, the screen is visible okay. and you're more uh, fluid. More stable? Okay, good. Thank you so much, Gikan. Thank you. So I think this gives an idea. I won't let you go through the whole um for the sake of showing you what the seed garden looks like more recently uh this is still uh, so we have both vegetable uh, propagation here as well as um uh, herbal medicines uh, medicinal herbs um and fruit fruit trees local um and tree varieties that we um, uh, multiply from seed. Uh, here you see uh, sweet potatoes and uh, turmeric and leucina and 
so on and so forth. This is uh, where we concentrate our uh, saplings. Uh, here is, uh, because I have so little time, I'll just go. Oh, that's my son, my middle son. Um, we also started integrating uh, propagation in between the rows of our olive grove, uh, like so. I don't know if you're able to die and see. Let me see if I can get this it's better. Here underneath in the understory we're propagating. Here is maybe it's harder to see, but it's integrated in syntropic bed shapes. Um, you see uh, broad beans in and amongst tree plantings. Here's some other examples. This is another property, yet another property where we have different uh, soil conditions, but I won't go into any detail. I just want to um, provide a feeling. This is yet another pro property. This is the smallest property we work on. It's 450 square meters. And it is, uh, we have only been working on this uh, approximately five years now, uh, but it really is a 450 square meter jungle. Uh, of all types of fruits and vegetables on all lakes. It's really beautiful, beautiful to see and observe and to walk amongst it and harvest and, and share and enjoy. So maybe to close, um, transforming our value definition, I think is, is as John also so eloquently puts, uh, the most critical um, driver that we will, we will need and I try to put it in my own words, um, from serving individuals endless desires by monetary maximization techniques that are based on debt economies and war strategies to breathable air, drinkable water, nutrient dense, clean food, farming cultures that serve the functioning of natural cycles, thriving local and circle economies and vibrant communities. I think this is, this is what we um, ought to, um, right for and uh, what makes uh, most sense uh, for us and, and for those who are um, um, coming after us. I just found this, which um, I thought was really nicely put. You have to ask yourself if our economic system actively destroys the biosphere and fails to meet most people's basic needs, then what is actually the point? And maybe I'll leave you with that. Thank you so much for listening and for having me. Thank you, Alp, for sharing this. Uh, yeah, your inspiring story and the work that you are doing. It's, it's really amazing. I think a lot of people have questions for you. Uh, I already saw some in the chat. So if you do have a question, you can raise your hands by clicking on the reaction button and raise your hands. Oh, maybe you can um, stop sharing. Stop That's sharing. what I was yes. just trying to do. Yeah. Yep. Then we can see everyone again. Hello. Are there any questions for Alp? I saw a question about water management. Sorry, John, we couldn't hear you. Still can't hear you, John. Still muted. Of course you can't. I turned off my blue, my Yeti. Yeah. It's back on. All right. No questions for Alp. Or are we still? Plenty. I think the, yeah. the water question is very important. Um, yeah. What's your rainfall and what's the difference between rainfall and available moisture? Um, what's the difference between the rainfall and available moisture? Um, I don't know specifically. I do know that we have um, up to 800 millimeters um, of rainfall per year. I do know that precipitation um, over evaporation is prevalent over seven uh, months of the year. Um, so 
precipitation over evaporation is about four or five months of the year. Um, but uh, the ratio, I would not be able to say. I don't know. All right. I see a question from, from Jonathan. Uh, what is your water source and is there a potential for depleting the aquifers? Aquifers. Oh, well, absolutely. Um, on the campsite, we have no water source. Um, it's the rain and in the summertime, we have been uh, using uh, water from uh, water source, um, both aquifer, but also um, uh, from a location that's fairly in the vicinity, about two kilometers, two to three kilometers away, uh, where groundwater level is very high, so the water is readily available. Um, and we transport uh, the water in uh, two to four ton tank, tanks behind tractors, um, to give uh, life force to the to the seedlings and saplings uh, over the course of summer, I would say on an average of one uh, once a month, and aim to keep the plants alive um, over the course of the summer with a lot of mulch. Um, in fact, we almost exaggerated in certain areas, but we're we're. In despite of that, um, hard hit uh, this last summer, about 40% of our saplings dried out because of um, uh, temperatures that reach 57 degrees um, due to wildfires. Sad to hear that, Al. Um, uh, but I, I think I, I, I also like to say that the way we use the land uh, um, also in other properties is by uh, either terracing, um, uh, putting in um, ponds and swales. We have where we have our base and our home and our workshop and seed garden and all. Uh, we have we have built cisterns before we built anything else. So we have you know um, cisterns that are built on traditional style where we uh, have a reservoir of about 300 uh, tons of water that we then um, uh, gravity feed alongside uh, the um, terraces. Uh, that is that does not suffice though for, for throughout the summer. Uh, we do need to get support from uh, the village water that is channeled. You have to write your name. You have to um, enter your name uh, in the list. And when it's your turn, you get water, and we fill our cisterns with it. And as a third. Um, uh, option, we do have an aquifer uh, on our property as well. So we try to put as little impact on the uh, on that uh, and as much focus on um, harvesting the and using the water passively. Thanks. Kat, do you have a question? Yes, thank you. I have, I have two actually. Um, I know that when we were in a conversation online a few days ago, you mentioned something about how you're starting to experiment with planting different vegetation that hasn't traditionally been indigenous to your area in response to climate change. And I, th I think it was uh, vegetation that's more prevalent in North Africa. So I'd love you to tell the group a little bit more about that. And then secondly, I'm just dying to know what opportunities there are for campers at functional forests to get involved in all the amazing work that you're doing and diverse work too. Yeah, Thanks. thank you. Uh, if I may, if I may quickly share some um, uh, pictures here, just to give you a little idea in terms of, let me see if I can take this out. Can you, can you see my screen? Yeah. These are some um, of our experiments, some of our uh, consortiums that we're trying out. Uh, just want to give you a feeling of them before I tell you some varieties. 
obviously these are close-ups and it seems to be moving fairly slowly but um so what we tried to interview um by means of using the syntropic farming method um um all the stratus all the layers of uh forest a functional forest that meets all of our needs from from building materials to um obviously uh, producing the biodiversity biomass and organic matter that is that is needed to have uh, a strong and, and striving forest um through to uh you know protein and oils and essential oils as i said foods and medicines um and fibers um so these are a few examples that might give you a little sense of how in the mediterranean um um when you see when you look at this picture for example up to the top of it you see how dry it is uh we still out sorry drive to to, you. Yeah. yeah we can only see the little mini thumbnail images we can't see the full pictures oh is that right yeah why is that why is that i wonder see, see this no yes. it's still the same collection of thumbnails oh well you may be sharing the the wrong screen up alp you have to um, unshare and then open the picture that you want to show and then and then use that rather than your your whole thing okay um let me see so do you see this soon not yet it's black <clears throat> oh there it is okay. there it is okay okay so you actually didn't see all the pictures i showed so far no we saw the thumb thumbnails yeah oh saw no the whole front page with the thumbnails all oh the thumbnails. my all right well that's too bad so let me let me just very quickly show you show you a few more close-ups just to give you an idea um so these are you see on from peanuts to the others. Um, middle you see figs, uh, you see rosemary, uh, you see, uh, let's see. Probably um, best to drop geranium. your, probably best to drop your video once more so that, uh, so that it goes more smoothly. Okay. Oh. Much better. I think it it has to do with the, with our connection with my connection. Um, I apologize for that. Well, if you have seen a few uh, visuals, maybe that that gives you an idea. And so the the first question was in terms of plant varieties, and they go. Um, um, I guess all the way from um let me see why is that showing me start my video now sorry um we're we're trying out um wild varieties um as well as domesticated varieties um we are um experimenting with uh, a variety called grevia tenax for example uh that uh, is very high in iron and uh, particularly great uh, for women um, and unfortunately uh, i can't say much as of yet because that's been just on site for a couple of years and i was expecting it to grow much faster but it is not um, um, things like sweet potatoes um, and 
uh, turmeric and things like that from South America have done a lot better than those varieties <laughs> from North Africa. So um, we are trying. I said that during that talk, uh, but I wouldn't say that it's it's uh, working here and it's a work in progress. We're experimenting with a lot of varieties. The other one in terms of campers, um, um, well, I guess we need to talk about the um, uh, the context and the uh, the length of the stays and what people are bringing. And I think I was pretty clear, or we're also pretty clear on our camp page, that we really need to um, host people that can help us uh, during this time. Um, we have a lot of uh, work and a lot of conditions to respond to, um, and um, hosting um, should go hand in hand with really taking up um, responsibilities here on site. So if, if people are ready to take responsibility um, on various jobs, then we can of course um, talk about that one-on-one -on -one and um, hear and see what people are intending to bring and what they're interested in. Um, yeah, I, I I would like to talk to you about how the announcement should be made so that it makes it easier for people to be able to apply. I thought our page was fairly uh, well set up and hopefully they can try uh, connecting with us via the, the camp page. Thank you, Alp. Gath has shared your camp page in the chat so everyone can have a look. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Alp, I did uh, ask you to stop your video, so therefore uh, it asks you to um, start your video again because we can't see you now. So therefore you got this pop-up question. Yes, okay. you're back. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Ash, do you still have a question? Oh. No, I don't. I was I was just raising my hand with politeness to tell Alf about the thumbnail thing, but then I just went for it with my words. So I'll lower my hand now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ash. I hope you're feeling better. Thanks, Alp. Yeah, I am. Good. I see a question in the chat from uh, Russ Cohen. Russ, are you willing to ask Alp your question in person? Because I see you have... Um, sure. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yeah. Okay, so um, so he, here in my region of the U.S., we're very much interested in planting native species to support uh, ecological functions, the food web, our native birds and, and insects and so on. And I see a great opportunity to achieve multiple objectives by doing that, as well as plant plants that are useful for humans for food and fiber and stuff like that. So I was just inquiring to the extent, if any, that you're trying to work that into what you're doing in your project. Um, I did not understand the, the last part um, acoustically, uh, Ross, I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Uh, can you read the chat? Because I've written the question in the oh, chat. Oh, okay, okay. For examples of how to incorporate ecological functionality into No, before that. Oh. It's it's a little bit. Do you see it up or I can read it? No, can you can you read it please? Um to what seeing. extent, if any, are you planting native uh, to your region plants, species that might serve important ecological functions? such as serving as food for insects there are in turn for food for birds that might also have value for people for example food or fiber i would say 60 70 percent to a large extent 60 to 70 percent of what you're planning are native species yes oh wow that's pretty high. Yes, all all our new plantings, uh, we set ourselves a bar of, of planting, you know, um, around uh, 80 percent. But I can't say we're there. Um, but that's what we're aiming for. 
I think we can have a whole conversation at some point just on natives and invasives and aliens and all of that. I think it's a very important conversation because there's some uh, sort of vilification of certain species which <clears throat> are a little bit difficult when they are pioneer species which are replacing something which is missing um, and they're just doing a task and when they finish that task then they'll probably be supplanted by the legacy genome but i mean this has to be observed i mean and there are certain other species which are really really terrible in the fact that they spread so rapidly and that they have some allopath or something that won't allow other plants to, to live. So they have very, very powerful defenses to ensure their survival and to, to take over some other habitat. But um, <clears throat> we'll, we'll lovely to have that conversation at another time. I would just very quickly like to say that um, uh, with my um, experience, uh, and of course, I can't um, speak 100%, but what I can say is that the more invasive, the better uh, in the initial initiation phase of the plantings. And if you set up the, the planting area and if you have the appropriate technologies for pruning, uh, then um, to me, that is a better way um, uh, forward with accelerating growth of the, the uh, keystone species and, and species that you'd like to keep for the long term, um, then try to haul uh, organic matter from elsewhere or use um, organic inputs from elsewhere. Um, that, that's my experience and that's my observation. Thank you. Oh, I, I do see as people asking if, if uh, you were able to share your presentation with, with all of us after the session. Yes, absolutely. Okay, that's great. Um, I do see uh, more questions in the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand so you can ask the, the question in person. Um, but I do see a question from Kandan Turhan. I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. And she's asking uh, what wild harvesting means. Uh, she saw that in the announcement for tonight. And maybe you can explain that a little bit. Inge? Yes? I'm sorry, did you? I did not hear anything. Oh, you okay? I'm sorry. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes. All right. And um, there was a question in the t in the chat asking about uh, what wild harvesting means. Uh, she saw that in the announcement. So maybe you can okay. explain a little bit about wild harvesting. Thank you. Yeah. Wild harvesting is picking um, food from the wild, wild har harvesting is picking fruit uh, and greens uh, to eat, but it is also um, picking um, seed material, uh, cuttings, um, mushrooms. Um, yeah, that's generally the scope of our wild harvesting. Uh, we also do a little bit of um, um, seaweed harvesting uh, from the shores of um, the uh, Kyrgyz Lake on season when it's available and when it has um, withered with permission from local authorities. Nice, nice. And do you also collect seeds to do sort of seed banking activities? Yeah, I mean, I have been working with seeds for almost 20 years. I've been working in also in an institute, in a seed institute 
um, uh, in New Zealand for a year. And then when I came back to Turkey um, in 2010, that's what I uh, immediately started uh, doing. And I continuously uh, seek for um, seed varieties. But I have to say, um, seed banking, unless it is an uh, actively planted and year by year renewed seed bank, uh, is a very dangerous endeavor. I think over the re last 10, 20 years, a lot of people have just um, put themselves out and have been extremely enthusiastic about um, going to seed share, sharing events and uh, buying seeds and selling seeds and exchanging seeds and setting up all sorts of seed um, sheds and um, rooms and cupboards and whatnot. And then those those seeds just basically going to waste. And I think it is it is the worst thing we can do. Uh, only those who can uh, year by year renew their um, germplasm, their their seed materials, um, should be having a seed bank. I think um, we have a seed room ourselves, and we have about two thousand varieties. And two thousand varieties we are not able to keep up with, so we are. Uh, you know, on the rapid uh, pace to, to diminish. Of course, you can have very little amounts from different varieties and, and try them out, but you also know that, that seed viability also goes down over um, uh, every year. So, yeah, that's what I think about the seed, seed issue. Thank you. That's also interesting information. Um, are there any more questions or follow-up questions? I will quickly look in the chat. I do, I do have another question, but <laughs> I don't want to uh, overrule anyone. Um, but I, I'll, I'm curious, um, how are the conversations going with any um, landowners in your surrounding or other farmers um i'm curious yeah thank you for the question well um the conversations with the landowners in our area uh is going horribly <laughs> because um the turkish lira has lost uh tremendous value and continues to lose uh tremendous value and on a daily basis um, so the land prices have increased over uh, 200 fold and when you have that kind of a value um, lunacy I'll call it it's very difficult to to motivate anyone to do anything but as I said the really um, traditional uh, villages those who um, have fought for their land and their trees also over the course of the summer. Um, um, those who want to uh, continue their uh, legacy um, are, are really interested, as I said, increasingly interested. Over the course of the summer, we've also been asked more and more about trees and tree planting and how to integrate trees in the, in the, in the farming practices. Um, and we are getting... Um, um, more and more positive feedback from people who were closely working with in the village. And on another note, uh, uh, even though um, I said what I said with regard to those areas that have been burned and um, are influenced uh, strongly by the um, governmental um, initiatives, um, there is also uh, a group, a large group of experts that I'm a part of, uh, that I had been a part of in these last three months, where we're developing a, a, a development and a restoration project um, for four to five of those villages that have been affected by fires. So that is going fairly swiftly and boldly, and the Global Eco, Eco Village Network is also a part of it. Uh, and so that is something that um, might actually uh, pull an important trigger for our area and other areas in the country in terms of a uh, way of doing 
things. You know, I, we're talking there all the way from water harvesting to agricultural um, um, uh, transformation to um, archaeological uh, um, sites uh, being turned into uh, areas where, where communities can take um, um, a responsibility and integrate with their, in, you know, income in some form or shape, you know, that which they, ha they have been producing, they have, uh, they might have opportunities in those areas to um, sell to visitors, archaeological site visitors, and also visitors from the sea, um, and so on and so forth. So there's, there's, um, um, I think this is this is a time where where things have started churning. I don't like talking too much before things start happening, uh, but yeah, things start to churn also in our area. I think we'll see we'll be able to sit in a in a local uh, village cafe and be able to have chats around ecosystem restoration. That's my vision. <laughs> step by step. Thank you, Alp. John. Thank you. Yeah, I just wonder if it, you know what I've been looking at and considering for some time and and we've we've done a bit of this is that if we do a kind of well it could be systematic like theory u or it could be just a more laissez-faire but if we if we have things are discussed in public and for instance if if alp needs to have specific people come and maybe they need he needs specific skills and he maybe he needs some financial support for that and so on maybe we could have a, a small committee or one or two people who take on the idea of working with alp to design exactly what he needs and if he if he needs five people or ten people and he needs twenty thousand dollars or fifty thousand dollars or something like that. Then let them take that as a task, because I think there's some people who haven't yet got their own camps or you know they're they're they want they want to be involved. So if they if there, if there were one or two or five people who wanted to come together to say let's go to Turkey, let's help out to set up a you know, a, a training program that is training by doing. So it's not, it's not like, let's go and we're going to just relax and hang out and maybe learn a little something, but we're actually going to take on a task that is needed in Turkey at the, at the functional forest camp and design it exactly what's needed together with Alp and then go out and find these people, go out and find the resources to make it happen. And that way it doesn't, it doesn't like, it isn't like somebody shows up who maybe is high maintenance and, you know, it, it just want, go, is going for fun and doesn't really want to do anything. But the right people with the right skills and the resources come at the same time and the planning is there so you know exactly how many people you can house and you know how many meals and all of that sort of thing. And I would also throw in this, uh, this um, creator space idea again, because I'm really, I'm really uh, keen on this, that uh, <clears throat> if you get the creator space and you get the central kitchen right, you get the whole community because they'll all come to you. And I think we can go even further and say seed banks and and especially Alp, if you're talking about doing it correctly so that the seeds are not dehydrated and frozen for a hundred years or some kind of thing, um, but our, the legacy genome is protected. And I think Russ, it looks like Russ has a lot of knowledge in this. So I hope he is, a, you know, goes with us for the long haul on this uh, on this path, but <clears throat> then the other thing that I think is critical is the understanding of of botanical sanctuaries. So if if we understand the concept of botanical sanctuaries, it's not simply seed banks and renewing them. It's also planting out the most endangered perennials as well. But <clears throat> but anyway, the idea would be get a small committee, 
give them the task of creating a training course that is in something that's done that you need so that let's say 10 people are needed to go and do this training course and there would be one or two people who are experts and there, there are eight people who are who are maybe capable of doing things and are eager to participate in that so then how much money is required and so on that could that could be dealt with in in numerous ways but um the the other thing that i think is happening <clears throat> and we're going to see this more and more is that the value of functional ecosystems in the dominant economic system is zero and this is why you have this collapsing scenario of the economic system and the real value of functional ecosystems is vastly higher than anything that human beings have ever made and everything that human beings will ever make so the the situation is really quite different than it seems at the moment so we're now in a in a almost fantastic or you know illus illusory situation where the true value is is zero it is said to be zero and the false value of materialism is said to be worth more and the basis of our economy well we can't have a consumption economy with the number of human beings that we have because we end up with these um well b the billionaire class or you know whatever trillionaires or they want to go to space or whatever and the and the billions of people who are starving on the earth or are wandering around at the edges of large degraded ecosystems they are you know they're they they don't have any rights never mind that's not acceptable so i think we need to be having this conversation um deeply consistently but not in an argumentative way but in like well what are we going to do about this this is what it looks like and there's got to be another way so coming together and answering hard questions and we're talking about very very hard questions the the hydrological system is not simple but the fact is evolution brought the water the moisture quite close to the earth and so we have to learn how to keep the moisture very close to the earth. And when we don't, then we get these disruptions and climate disruptions and temperature changes. So now we haven't been empowered to in, in by the governments or by, by everybody else. But if we don't need permission, if we're able to just go and say, we will do it and go do it, then we're actually creating more value than anyone else. And ultimately, if you have a central kitchen, a creator space, a seed bank, a regional seed bank, and a, and a botanical sanctuary, you're the most valuable place in your region for sure. So this is, this is kind of like how I see this possibly playing out. Thank I hope everybody likes that vision mm -hmm. too. Thank you, John, for sharing your ideas and and um, also yeah the idea of maybe helping out this way. Um, there was a good question from Hannah asking what what type of skills uh, is Alp um, looking for? Do do is that something that is? Um, I I think Kath sent uh, our link uh, on the camp pages where there is an area of a, a list there yeah that's that great and, and people can contact you by filling in the application form that's correct right yeah i also wrote my email address into the chat here oh, if that's people great. have further questions okay well i would recommend that if you have any ideas or you feel that you would love to help out in in a way um Please. I think Patricia wanted to ask a question. I thought her hand was raised. No, maybe not. <laughs> Sorry. No worries. Sorry. Well, thank you, everyone. I don't know if there is still uh, a question from from one of you uh, for Alp or for for the um, ideas that John raised. 
Um, well, I want to say thank you to John for thinking about those things. Um, and I think it needs to be crafted out well. Uh, and yeah, I mean, that is the only way we'll be able to make progress and be able to bring in skill sets together in order to make um, uh, things happen that otherwise are uh, not possible to, to be done. Uh, and I would say um, it, it is the resourcefulness that we're, that we're looking for because the resources that we're looking after um, that may be you know, categorized under the name of funds um, I think are the easiest ones to get. I think the, the hardest ones to get is to, to have the, not only the skill sets, but also the, the chemistry working because, um, and also with the, you know, there were a number of questions with regard to, you know, volunteering or, or visiting and camp, camp um, uh, stays. Um, you know, we are really open, but we are really open for, for long-term um, um, commitment. Uh, we want to work with people who are committed uh, and not who are fishing. Um, you know, fishing is right. Fishing is also needed. Don't get me wrong. It's just um, possible to do during the camp um, organizations when we have a camp event, a week, two, three weeks or something like that. But when we're talking um, about you know engagement and really transforming something, really bringing no knowledge and experience and wisdom together, we really need to eat a lot of meals together. We really need to wake up early and and go to bed late together for a you know while. We can't just get that done um, by means of um, setting up you know two dates, beginning and end date. We just have to set the beginning date and then see, see where we go from there. I mean, you know, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank you. I think maybe some people, um, we've, we've been here now an hour and a half and some people may need to go. I know some people have already had to go, but um, I think if, it's, if there's no other real serious questions, we could just stay here and have, it, with anybody who wants to stay and have an open conversation. If, if, if you want to stay and have an open conversation, I think you have to open your, your camera. So make sure you're wearing pants and so on. <laughs> uh, but, um, but then, uh, but then let's, uh, let's stay and have a conversation with anybody who wants to stay. I know I see, Daniel and, and Candida, uh, I, I haven't seen them since they left here on their way back from, uh, from um, Glasgow to Portugal and they're back in Portugal and they were just at the uh, Altiplano camp, which is exciting and interesting. And, and Ferdy is here. Um, unfortunately, he wasn't still at the camp in Spain. So you, I guess you didn't get to see him, meet him. No, but. that's a pity, but they will come, they will come. <laughs> and uh, it's fair to say, John, um, 49 people from all over the world has joined this session tonight, um, which is amazing. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, feel free to stay, obviously, for this open discussion with John. Um, but if you need to leave, then also feel free <laughs> to, to leave as well. Um, it's not just with John, it's with everybody. It is with everybody, for everybody who wants to say. But I, I still want to, to say th thanks to Alp for, for giving this presentation and sharing your journey with us. And uh, I really admire all the work that you do. Um, and I think this session will, was very valuable for everyone here. So um, thank you for taking this time. Thank you. Well, Thank you for taking this time and listening so patiently. Thank you very I, I much. Think, I think especially, Alp, I know that you've been having some trouble with the health of your family and, and difficulties in the country. So thank you so much for doing this for us. And, for, and hopefully it will all be for everyone's. It's for all of us, yeah. yeah. Hopefully it's, it's, it has something that serves all of us. So thank you.
Well, now everybody who's still here, can you turn on your cameras or are you going to stay hiding back there or you're not wearing pants? <laughs> <laughs> They're leaving us. <laughs> okay. Well, it's, it's good to see everybody. Uh, and Mick, Mick. Hello. Where, where are you? You've got a loft up there or something. <laughs> it's um, my, my former student house in Wageningen. I've been I here see. for a while. Oh, yeah. Lovely. Is that in that wonderful place that, what was it called? Um, Druvendal or Druven? Precisely, yeah. Druvendal. Yes, yay, Druvendal. <laughs> so wonderful place. Yeah, great you know about it. Hmm. Yeah. I see you have a hand raised. Is that intentional? Yeah, uh, it is actually, Mick. Um, I think that many people here this evening actually haven't met you before and I think it would be amazing if you could introduce yourself as the newest member of the ERC support team and excitingly tell everyone what your, your formal new role entails and what it's going to see you doing over the next year because it's really exciting. Yeah, yeah, sure. I'm very happy to, um, to tell a little bit more about that and about uh, my role. So I have began working with ERC as a student intern when I was enrolled here in Wageningen. Um, and now since November, I'm um, working as the impact measurement coordinator um, to hopefully support and help all the camps uh, to collect ecological data, but also data on um, personal transformation happening, you know, with, among the campers who are um, visiting the camps, participating in experiences, and even collecting data. And also, um, we hope to be looking at socioeconomic indicators. Um, so we're now working with a, one framework that is, that is considering the three components, soil, soul, and society, inspired in uh, Satish Kumar's book. And um, yeah, right now I'm, I'm learning from the camps what, uh, what the restoration goals are and um, yeah, hopefully working towards monitoring programs that, that help each camp to, uh, to monitor these aims and you know, keep track of their, of their work and, and hopefully work to, towards successful outcomes. So that's uh, a little bit about me and I'm, um, yeah, I'm still at, you know, I'm still at a very small subset of camps right now. So I actually didn't manage to talk with uh, Alp yet. Um, it's been really nice to, to hear about functional forests and uh, the type of work that you are doing there. And I think there's so much to learn. So I look forward to, to engage in the conversation with greater depth as well. Welcome, Mick. <laughs> Thank you. And I also realized that John is in the Netherlands at the same time I am. So hopefully we can, our paths can still uh, meet tomorrow or so because I'm leaving tomorrow. Well, yeah. I'm in, I'm in Hunekan near Utrecht where and you're in Wageningen. So not too far. Not too far. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to see for all the testing I need to do now, but yeah, we'll, uh, we'll be in touch about that. Okay. Listen, I, I had a very big interest in what Russ was asking about. Russ Cohen, are you, are you still on or are you wearing pants? I'm still on. <laughs> so I'm having my lunch. <laughs> oh, it's okay. noon time here in Massachusetts. So it's, uh, it's dinner so time. Will here. I have a bite. It's, it's dinner time, but I, I, I had it with behind my picture earlier. It was soup. <laughs> Highly <Soup>. recommended. <laughs> but tell us, Russ, about native species and what, what you're thinking. All right, so very briefly, um, <clears throat> so I retired from my day job with the Mass Fishing Game Department back in 2015. And since then, I'm playing the role of Johnny Appleseed, in case any of you know who he is or was, for edible native species. And I've set up a nursery outside of Boston where I'm propagating over a thousand plants, uh, most of which I, I started growing from seed I gathered myself. And then I'm working on arrangements with organic farms and land trusts and 
tribal groups and state and federal agencies, schools and colleges and stuff to plant plants in my nursery in appropriate places on their properties. I've done about two dozen projects so far. So no communal kitchens. And I'm not really growing stuff at a scale that can provide significant food supply. But what I'm doing is further diversifying sites with edible native species that fit in with the plants that are already there is basically what I'm doing. Well, if I could ask you a couple of questions, like we have one camp that's forming in Appalachia, and it's a it's a mountaintop removal site with it's it's huge. It's seven thousand acres. It's it's got quite a you know tremendous challenges, obviously, because the sort of social economic psychological addiction issues, um, poverty issues there are intense. And so um, I think botanical sanctuaries, and you have to also maybe could possibly help answer this. I think they're more valuable than, box, you know, giant stores filled with plastic junk from China or whatever it is. It, it can't, you know, it can't, it can't be true that a bunch of TV sets and a bunch of telephones that are going to end up leaking toxic substances into the landfill sometime soon are more valuable than our functional ecosystems. And if, if you know, if we could, if, if we could help, for instance, all the camps or places like the new camp in, in, in Appalachia to become a botanical sanctuary where it really did a serious job of going out and, and protecting, propagating, and planting out the most endangered species in the region. This would be like a huge sacred responsibility, but also of enormous value. What's your thinking about this kind of idea? Would you be able to help others to, to get into this area? Um, yes, but I know a better group than me a group that's local to that area, and it's called United Plant Savers, and I'm going to drop the link into the chat for them. Do you know, is that Chris? Uh, Hold on a second. I got the wrong link. I'll, I'll grab it. And, yeah, keep talking. It, it, there's a guy named Chris something. Do you know who, who's who's the principal in there, Dr. Um, Chris? Well, it's, it's mainly a woman-owned group, so... Uh, okay. That name doesn't sound familiar. United Plant what? United Plant Savers. Uh, this uh -huh. isn't the right link. Hold on, I'll grab it here. Okay. Yeah, I was it's at the in Bio... Rutland, Ohio. It's it where? It's in Rutland, Ohio. It's in the Appalachian section of Ohio. Okay. All right, I just found it. All right. So I will drop this in the chat. A few years ago, I went to the Bionutrient Association in Massachusetts. Oh, yeah, I know them. Yeah, and um, I th there were seed saving and seed exchange there. It was beautiful. I think that should be massively supported. And, like, we have camps now in Somalia and Syria and Morocco and Jordan and Egypt and so on throughout Africa, different places. I think it could be enormous if we could help those places to have systemized seed collection, seed trading, seed saving. It would help them escape from this, this Monsanto mono, monoculture and, and uh, genetically modified seeds that are being promoted even by Bill Gates and the and the Gates Foundation in, in Africa. So it's it's really tough when they when somebody like Gates and the Gates Foundation gets to the government in Africa, they listen. They they turn that into a policy. It's it's horrifying. So anyway, if you can help I, g I gave you, I uh, thank you. I'm, now I have your email and so on. Let's stay in touch. Okay. Thank you. Sure. I mean, I have a question about this. 
Um, I'm thinking about the Greening Sahel, uh, I mean, uh, Sinai and so on, and it's a kind of uh, area where there's no kind of native uh, plants. What would you recommend to do in there? Are you talking about the Sahel in Africa? Uh, um, I was thinking up, uh, actually Sinai. In the Sinai? Yeah. Well, you know, there is a botanical garden in Cairo, um, which is quite amazing. Let me see. Um, but there, there, and there is a, there is a Flora Palestinia. There is a, I think it's, it's several volumes. I, I, I have it, I have it physically and digitally. So it's a quite large thing. And, you know, these are the areas, these places were called the land of milk and honey and the Garden of Eden. So, you know, they definitely have uh, a legacy genome. And we're, <clears throat> I think the, the thing that we're looking at in the Sinai is more that um, the whole food web is disrupted. So it's really microbial and fungal activity that needs to be um, stimulated. And, but they may be dormant. So we, we, we're there, 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 there I, I don't know if you've seen the Holy Grail of restoration. Yep. Did he disappear? I think John froze there. <clears throat> yeah, I think he disappeared. Might be a battery issue or internet. Mm. That's really unfortunate. Yes, it is. Does anyone else want to um, answer Tanya's question or have a question for her? Because I think John... I, I'd be interested, are you at Camp Habiba? Where, where are you, Tanya, in Sinai? No, actually, I'm, I'm in Finland for a moment, but I'm planning to go into Habiba later. But uh, because we're talking about the native uh, plants, so I was thinking because they're basically not growing anything for a moment, but I understand I haven't been there yet. So how to choose the plants what is going to be growing there? Right, and they're not growing anything native at the moment? So. I, I don't know what's in there, because now it's a desert, isn't it? So if they're oh. breeding the Sinai, so what kind of plants they're going to choose? Right, hmm. I don't have the answer, but I'm sure that they have some. Hmm. Anyway, yeah. I see another a question from Kandan Tulhan. I'm, I'm really sorry if I mispronounce your name, sorry. Of course you do, it's a difficult name to pronounce. Can you hear me well? Yes, we can. How, how do I pronounce it correctly? The first name is like a J, it's Jandan. Ah, Jandan. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> sorry about that. So, um, yeah. Um, I wasn't sure if this was the right platform to ask this question and maybe the answer is in your website or something, but since we're just having a conversation, I decided to ask, um, where, where do you start the design of these, of these ecosystem uh, restoration camps? How, um, you know how how does the uh, design work or or is this um is this a method that is you know systematically implemented if we decide to become a camp because i have this um i have this area in uh, middle anatolia that i'm trying to kind of uh, restore and uh, use agriculturally and um, we haven't been very successful uh, so far and um, you know i'm always looking for um, you know other more uh, productive ways of taking care of it thank, thank so. you thank you for asking and how exciting that you're starting um, to restore the land. 
Um, yes, we do. We do have uh, information about this available on, on our website, and we also developed uh, the ecosystem restoration design course to to help you with that. But unfortunately, it just started in September twin or twenty twenty one, and the next one will be starting again in September 2022, but there are several um, modules. And I believe that the last module is about um, design, designing, and it will start, I believe, around April, if I'm correct. Mm -hmm. um, so if you want, I can write down your email address and can send you some more information about that. Um, yes, we can do that, or I can contact you on the website. Yeah. Um, but then uh, another you know, basic question is how how do we become a camp? Maybe I'd like to become one of your camps, and how does that work? Yes. Um, well, that's also a really good question. Um, well, how you become a camp, it's, we, we do have a uh, become a camp guide on our, our website that it is explaining how it works. But there are some, some um, several things that are really important um, for us when we are starting to work with a project. And um, one of them is actually that the project is obviously... Um, a legal, a legal a project, a legal entity um, as well, preferably non-profit. Um, and we try to work with projects that are working beyond their fence as well. So projects that are not only focused on their own restoration activities, but also look beyond how can I help or influence other farmers or other projects and how can we really make this a local embedded um, initiative um because we realize that that is so important um to be successful in in all the restoration activities um and then preferably you have a, a design and ecosystem restoration plan in place so that we know that you are already um on 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 a certain level and um the idea is of the ecosystem restoration camps as well is that campers are are joining uh, your project to help you out and you we also see this as a sort of a business model to sustain um yeah your financial needs um so infrastructure should be in place uh you should it should be legal also to host to host campers and uh, yeah, we will just have a conversation on on, um, on on those aspects. Health health and safety policies are important as well. Um, but I have to say that we do have loads of um, projects applying um, that are still in the seed phase. That's how we call them. The, the, the projects that are still planning, still having the ideas. Um, and we would really like to help them, um, but we realize that we do not have enough resources to help them to grow from a C2 seedling. And therefore, we decided to currently work with seedlings and um, established camps only. Um, but we are developing a roadmap course that will be available in September 2022. And this will help projects um, grow from a seed to a seedling. And after you finished this roadmap journey, um, you are ready to apply to become a camp. Um, so uh, as you know, the ecosystem restoration camps um, just started in 2017. Um, so the supporting team is also still a startup and we try to help every project as much as we can, but it's also for us still a journey to figure out how we can do that in the, in the best possible way. So um, that's why we um, are working on this roadmap for, um, for the seeds. I hope that answered your question. Yes, it answered my question perfectly. And um, uh, it looks like I am at least a seedling. And I just uh, saw from the corner of my eye, uh, I'm writing to me. So yeah, I will communicate with them later, of course. I, had it in mind before asking the question anyway, but I just wanted to bring it up here. 
um, yeah, I do, I do fit a lot of the conditions that you just described where a, uh, we are an NGO and we are looking beyond our own land uh, to become a model for the area, which is basically an agricultural area, etc. So anyway, thanks a lot. I don't want to take any more time uh, from other well, questions. I think it's very, very valuable to, to ask this question because not everyone knows how to, how to become a camp and, and what the steps are. So I hope that it's valuable for more people. Uh, we do have the camp interest form or become, become a camp interest form on our page. And if you fill that in, we will contact you uh, to have a further conversation about. Uh, okay. About Okay, great. Thank you very much, Inga. Yes, no problem. Thank you for asking. And I see that John is back. Was it a battery issue, John? No, no. My Wi-Fi quit and I had to restart my Wi-Fi and then it came back. Oh. I was stifled. I'm, I'm about to be 70. I can't believe it, but uh, there it is. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm giving up on on technology. I don't believe in it anymore. <laughs> After spending a life in television, I don't believe in in technology. Crazy. Do, do you remember, John? Um, I, I can't yeah. also believe that you're almost 70. I mean, your spirit is still so high. So that's do not talk about age or numbers, because uh, I think the spirit and the energy is the most important thing. Um, do you remember what we were talking about? Um, you were, oh yeah, you were in conversation with Tanya. I think about native species in the Sinai region. Right. I, I'm going to send uh, the. I was I was looking for the. Uh, um, the Holy Grail of restoration. So let me let me put that into the uh, chat, and then everything went south nothing worked so let me see but keep talking don't 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 stop talking yes we were we just had a short conversation on how um projects can become a camp um Good. And I'm now reading the chat. Are there any other questions or? Yes. Go for it, Nick. Hi. Yes. Um, thanks everyone for hosting. I'm very curious. I noticed there's a, um, I have a question about rewilding in Holland as it relates to rewilding here in California. The, um, I know there is this site called i think i'm gonna mess mess up the pronunciation but ostwärtsplatz ostwärtsplatz now ostwärtsplatz thank you yeah i loved your pronunciation say it again say it again inga ostwärtsplatz ostwärtsplatz platz i'm i'm ostwärts yeah Waarde of Oostvaarder? Oostvaarder plassen, maybe. Is it Oostvaarder plassen? Oostvaarder, dacht ik. Ah, yeah, it is Oostvaarder plassen. Yeah. It's probably my uh, accent, my Dutch accent, that I make up my own words. So, so it's very similar here in California. We have a lot of, like, right here in Point Reyes, we have an elk refuge, but they're all fenced. And there's, and there's no natural predators, so they're, they're getting overpopulated and sick. And it's surrounded by dairy ranches. And so there's a, there's a lot of um, heated political discussion around the ethics of rewilding and why we can't create corridor, wildlife corridors where ecosystem function of predator, prey, and herd relationships can then begin to sequester the carbon and do the restoration naturally, right? Yet I find this Holland example so so fascinating because it is so dense of, in population and wondering if there couldn't be a camp 
um, that moves around the different farms and creates hedgerows that um, through all the farms of Holland to connect um, the the migrate migratory routes of the species that are fenced in this wonderful refuge so that they're they can re they can exchange genetic material with species of their kind throughout Europe. I love that idea. Nick, um, I maybe Nick or Ferdy is better answering this because I do know that we do have some eco roots, uh, but it's not going through uh, farms area, farming area. Nick, did you have anything about this concerning in your during your studies? Um, well, we 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 did slightly and lightly look into the um, effectiveness of these it's like um, bridges uh, crossing roads and okay. attempts to connect yeah to make habitat connectivity a little better um, the sad reality turned out to be that um, very few animals actually use these um, these mechanisms that we put in place um, so all the surveys done around you know, because there was a lot of studies conducted in terms of costs and benefits. And so they looked at how much it was actually being used by wildlife um, for the purposes it, you know, it was there um, to be used for. And it's not, it's not turning out to be very effective. Um, and I think one of the big challenges in this um, Ostwarders plus a, a project has been has has to do with the harshness of nature and also um, I think a learning curve regarding you know the right population in terms of um, how much grazing pressure is allowed what the carrying capacity is of the ecosystem and maybe the balance between um, predators which I, I believe well I don't know exactly but they were not they were not present or um, I think um, it's the human species was the only predator species being really uh, considered. And so it's, it's been a very, it's been a very reactive experiment. I think people were realizing, oh, wow, there's way too more, too many animals. Um, we, there's not enough food around. Um, also habitat connectivity is an issue perhaps to reach new territory. Uh, but yeah, I think I think there's very important lessons to be learned from from this um, initiative. I, I haven't really studied it myself, though. I have been there and had pretty good long talks with Franz Vida, who who designed this area. Hmm. And um, yeah, they. I think that death is part of life, and one of the biggest problems is that it's it's kind of covered up death is like cleaned up in the society so in in Ost, Ostverden's plaza plaza it's you know death is is there you know it's the trees are dead because they all the all the deer that came in there they ring the trees they, because there were too many deer and they they ate the, the trees and the trees fell over and so the trees are lying there dead and then if then when there isn't enough food then the deer die and then there are horses and there are these strange long you know all of these things they they really they and so i i think that the great greatest thing that happened was what happened to the um to the british the british started copying this in in um, manor houses and these big properties in the, in the UK. This is quite extraordinary. But I see that Daniel has something to say. He is a, a, a longtime forester who's been working in the Mata Atlantica in Brazil, and now he's in Portugal. So you got your hand up, so you better unmute. Hi, John. Thank you for inviting us to, to come here today. Miss you so much. It was amazing the, the time we spent with you there. Uh, yeah, I, I hear you talking about 
the problem of how to measure or how to, to get the species together after a very huge disruptive event like wildfires or cyclone or something. And then we have some strategic species, some key species uh, that almost all lost. And then we have other species that raise too much and get sick because they are unmanaged. So uh, I, I like to use the concept of adaptive, adaptive landscapes or fitness landscapes. It's more known into evolutionary biology, but I, I adapt this concept into um, ecosystem psychology or ecology of ecosystems because I think that ecosystems can really much be um, better understood if we have this idea that the, the species are like kind of cars running through the same direction and um, eventually one gets faster than the other and then it needs to break, and then the other one will just trespass it. It's kind of related to the concept of what's the name? Lotka Volterra cycle or something, which is basically that daisy world uh, model. So I like this concept because it makes simple the understanding that ecosystems are. Um, and evolutionary thing and the species are the genes like adapting to make everybody happy. Thanks for that, Daniel. Thank you. Um, I see Margarita, have you just joined us? Have you been here this whole time? You're muted. Yes, Margarita. recently, recently I, yeah, yes. Margarita is in Peru. And uh, I, I really hope, per Margarita is a fabulous sculptor. I must tell you, I slept in a house filled with sculptures and it was just the strangest thing. Um, but they're wonderful. And she's Thank also you. working to, to bring back a, a, a watershed high up in the Andes. Can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing now? What's, what's your biggest issue right now, Margarita? Well, my biggest issue, I think, is uh, um, like link it all these uh, water ponds and lakes that I uh, restore in order to uh, to use uh, the and uh, to keep the more uh, humidity in my farm before it leaves, no? Because it uh, runs uh, through a small, all these waters goes to a small uh, stream that is uh, aside my farm, and and they connect with uh, another one, the biggest one, and then to the river. So um, yes, I. I I bought this farm and I had a little bit of water like this and uh, now I have two lakes and like 14 ponds of water, uh, restoring the water. Through four years I've been walking all the, yeah, these, uh, and, and control lines are really essential or in, for doing this. It's, uh, it's the first step, I think. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Margarita. Hi as well. Uh, Hi. Um, <laughs> How is Ashley? Yeah, Ashley is okay. Yeah, she was she's, here. Yes, as she was here, she's doing better. Thank, thanks okay. for asking. Okay. I, okay. Uh, I, I unfortunately have to leave. Um, mm -hmm. I'm so sorry. I will make you the host, John, if that's all right. So feel free I to hope, continue. I um, hope my, my. Connection will stay on, but I think it's it's probably good. Yes. And what are you doing? Already coming in. My goodness, there's somebody coming in. Did you yes. did you allow 
somebody to come in? Robert? Yeah, I Robert think. Hayes has joined us. My goodness, people are still joining us. I just want to say thank you everyone for joining this session session and making it again an energetic and fun, fun session. Always brings me lots of energy. <laughs> um, and I want to wish you a very a nice, beautiful night or day. Hope to see you again soon. I also want to thank everyone. This was great. And um, if we don't see you, um, Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. <laughs> Yes. Hope to Echo, see you soon. Echo, Bye. Thank you. Thank you all. All. Bye. Happy holidays, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.